Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Great Decisions. It's great to see you all. As you all know, this is my favorite thing I get to do every single year, and I've been doing it now. I think this is my sixth year of doing this. Um, and how many of you have never been to a Great Decisions? Oh, that's awesome. That is so wonderful to see. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, but um, it's great when we can, um, uh, you know, sort of spread, spread the Great Decisions of Love a little bit further and a little bit wider. Um, we have the books. They are here. We will have them for sale throughout the series. This is the very first of eight weeks. Uh, they're $25 this year. They have gone up like everything else. It is the new normal, but um, knowledge is power. So there you go. Uh, the DVDs that accompany the series, we do not have yet. We are getting them probably next week. Uh, they were on back order. Um, I think that they are no replacement for the very, very fine speakers that you get to have in this series. But if you want the DVD, we will have it for you. And uh, the teacher's guide we also have available, which is something that we will be emailing out to you if you are leading a group. Um, I see that some of you grabbed these off the tables. These th things that say explore more are program guides for doing a great decisions group. So if you don't have a group, or you'd like to start a group, it is um, some hints on um, how, to, how to wrangle folks, how to ask the right questions, how to make sure people are talking. And if you want to do this, um, I don't know how many of you know this, but Great Decisions is the oldest, largest grassroots uh, global affairs program in the nation, which had its beginnings here in Portland in 1954. So um, like many things Portland does well, um, getting people connected to the world is another one of them. So um, we have more of these probably back in my office under a pile somewhere, so I'll make sure we have some more next week. We also have a list of everyone who will be speaking here that looks a little bit like this. If you have questions, you can always go to worldoregon.org. You can always email me at timd at worldoregon.org. And I love talking to people about Great Decisions groups and topics and resources and that sort of thing. Um, outside of Great Decisions, if you would like to do something a little bit more um, uh, irreverent and fun, next Wednesday you can join our young professionals at Migration Brewing for an evening of international trivia. So. Um, it may be a little early in the day to drink for great decisions, but you can definitely do it at Trivia Night. It begins at 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, also, I'm sorry, not Wednesday, Tuesday. Um, and then Wednesday next week, we have a really, really wonderful speaker coming in, a guy named Leif Wienar, who is a uh, chair of philosophy and law at King's College in London, who has written a book called Blood Oil, Tyrants, Violence, and the Rules that Run the World. And he worked with John Rawls and Robert Nozick and is a very, very bright man. And this book um, should uh, rattle some cages out there in the world. So again, Blood Oil, it is Wednesday. It's in, it's in our office at the World Affairs Council in the Oregon Historical Society. It starts at noon. You can register online for that. Also, one of the topics this year in Great Decisions is migration. And it's certainly something you're seeing above the fold every single day when you're reading the news. Immigration, migration, displacement. Um, so one of the topics um, this year in Great Decisions is, in fact, migration. And we are doing a K-12 teacher conference at the end of January at Concordia called Finding Place, the Human Face of Migration, Displacement, and the Search for Home. We were hearing a lot from high school uh, teachers that they wanted better tools to talk about immigrants and refugees in their classrooms. So we put together this program, which is also available to the community. And we would love to see um, not only uh, you know, 100 or 200 educators, we would love to see all of you there as well, because it's a very, very important topic, which will look at the international piece, the national piece, and regionally how we're dealing with accepting um, new Portlanders and new Oregonians into our lives and into the fabric of um, of this wonderful place we live. Um, and then one last little thing is um, today's topic is Cuba. And we at the council are sponsoring two trips to Cuba. One is going next week. And we have just extended the early bird price uh, for the trip in March. Randy Miller, raise your hand. Randy Miller is going to be leading. He is our board chair this year. He will be leading the trip to Cuba. and you will have the time of your life if you go with Randy Miller. So that is on our website as well. 
Um, oh, is anyone curious about the International Speaker Series? Yeah. Would you like to know who's speaking? Yeah. Great, don't hold your breath because you may turn blue, but within a week or so, um, I will announce it and I will tell you. And um, it will make you so happy. Um, I don't want you to turn blue, but you will be tickled pink when you find out who it is. So, so, so hold on. Um, some of you uh, who attended our talks around Cuba Libre in the fall may recognize today's speaker. And if anyone here is going on the Cuba trip, um, you're in for a treat because this will be sort of your, um, your, uh, your 101 for um, uh, what's going on um, right now, what, what led up to where we are at. Um, I'm really excited we could get Blair Woodard back. He is the man of the hour. Blair is an assistant professor of history at the University of Portland. He received his PhD in Latin American history from the University of New Mexico. His research on the visual culture of U.S.-Cuban relations has been funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations, the University of Portland, and University of New Mexico, and it is really exciting to have him here. Let's give Blair a big hand. Uh, all, of the, all of the events, so if you can't make one of these, you can go to our website, you can watch it live, and because we're streaming things live, um, you know, keep your four-letter words and the mosh pit and all that stuff out of it, because this is a family affair, so <laughs> thanks. Thank you, thank you Tim. Um, I want to thank Tim and the World Affairs Council and all of you for coming out. Um, as you said, I'm an assistant professor of history at the University of Portland, um, and what am I, I'm supposed to go 30 minutes, is that what I'm doing? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna give you 100 years of US-Cuban relations in 30 minutes. Uh, I think my students always say, you know, I'm gonna give you your money's worth, they're like, can't we just pay less? I'm like, no. Uh, so, so I got interested in Cuba, I was in Peace Corps in Guatemala from 1993 to 1995, and of course, Cuba was totally off the radar, off limits for us to visit, which made me wanna go there. Um, and then the Balsero crisis happened in 1994, and so friends of mine went to Guantanamo Bay to work as intermediaries between the refugees and the Navy. So that was kind of how it started, and then when I went back to graduate school um, in 1997, I started going in 1999 and have been five times. And so I actually just got back. Um, I was there New Year's uh, this year, so I just, just returned. Um, so just saw it, and there are changes happening pretty rapidly, which is exciting and, and daunting in some ways to, to watch. Um, so, so let's see, where, let's, let's go for here. So Cuba, right, this is the largest uh, island in the Caribbean. It's about 1,000 miles long, only 50 miles wide at its widest point. Um, very diverse in terms of sort of landscape with sort of mountains and beautiful sort of beaches and valleys and more beaches, <laughs> beaches. Um, the city of Havana is the largest city. It's about two and a half million people. Um, Santiago is the next largest city, both on opposite ends of the, of the island. Uh, the city of Havana itself, for any of you who are gonna go, and I encourage you all to go now, right? <laughs> you should go now, go with him. Um, it's a very diverse city, um, really interesting places. They're fixing it up a lot um, from when I first went. Um, and it's very, very dynamic, tons of music, um, you know, great, the people are, are friendly, lots of rum, <laughs> lots of flowers. Um, so it's a great place to visit. Um, in terms of the relations with the United States, the United States since its inception has been thinking, obsessing as it were really, about, about Cuba. Um, and the reason for this really comes back kind of to the geography. If you see Cuba, you know, oftentimes saying we're only 90 miles away right from Florida. It's also only 120 miles away from the Yucatan Peninsula, which really creates kind of this cork effect for the Gulf of Mexico. So early leadership in the United States saw the strategic advantage to, to possessing the island of Cuba as a means to protect the Mississippi River. So we didn't want anybody being able to basically come up and, and kind of shoot up into the middle of the country. And then we also saw it as very strategic for going back into the Caribbean and any sort of places, especially Panama, um, in terms of other places of interest. So early, early leaders, right? John Quincy Adams, Thomas Jefferson, identifying Cuba as this place that we wanted to have, right? A site of our shores in transcendent importance to our political and commercial interests of our union, right? That the island would give us 
over the Gulf of Mexico and the countries in the isthmus bordering on it, as well as all of the waters who flow in it, to fill up the measure of our political well-being. So we wanted it, right? And this idea on top that I wrote, no transfer, really became the US's policy towards Cuba, which was, as a Spanish possession, and we considered it to be an unnatural Spanish possession, since all the other countries had become independent, that our view was, as long as Spain had it, that was fine. But no other European power, no transfer to any other European power would be allowed. And that sort of expanded to really mean no transfer to even the Cubans themselves. So that we wanted to be involved with Cuba and to hold power over Cuba. So when the Cuban wars of independence start, there's three, there's three actual wars, right? There's sort of the Ten Years' War from 1868 to 1878. This Guerra Chiquita, which is the little war, which was less than a year, 1878 to 1879. And then finally, the War of Independence from 1895 to 1898. The United States paid a lot of attention to these wars. Um, up before the Civil War, we had asked Spain actually to annex it on several occasions. We'd offered to pay. But when we finally saw in 1898 that the, you know, that the war was kind of going towards, uh, towards the Cubans gaining independence, we became very interested, so much so that, you know, that McKinley was being pressured to, to enter into the war. And we ended up sending this ship down there, the USS Maine, in order to guard our vital interests. And we sort of plop it in the middle of Havana Harbor. And then in February of 1898, it explodes. Um, and the, you know, right away, the US press seizes a hold of this. Pulitzer and, and Hearst basically pump up the, the war rhetoric. And we are pressured. You know, the, the you know, Congress and the president basically decide to go to war. And we do. And so the, you know, the Spanish-American War, which often normally until sort of recently has admitted the Cuban and Filipino parts of that war, right, lasts only for four months. And we go in and we win. And then what we are given, of course, is Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and then eventually the Philippines. Um, we, we go in, we stay in Cuba for three years, and then we're able to essentially dominate the island for the next uh, almost 60 years. So we stay there for a long time in sort of commercial interests, mainly sugar, railroads, uh, any kind of infrastructure, roads, the telephones, telegraphs, electric company, all of these businesses become owned by the United States. And so about 85% of all businesses and trade are owned, um, are owned directly by the United States government. And this is going to go on, of course, until, until the 1950s. Um, our connections to Cuba in the 1950s become really close. And so one of the big ways that people come to understand this connection is through this very popular television show, I Love Lucy, which from 1950 to 1957 was the most popular television show on with over 10 million viewers every week. And understanding this kind of you know, very you know, close marriage relationship between these two characters was emblematic of the relationship that people felt towards the island, that we were that close, that we were intimate partners that we were married, right? Tourism itself explodes in the 1950s, and this is where you have the big growth of hotels, sort of the Riviera and the Capri, all the sort of mob hotels that are going on at the time, the gambling, the sort of Havana nightlife that you see in a lot of movies. And it's marketed to bring US tourists to it. So there was no need to have a passport. There was no need to change money. There were special tourist police who spoke English to help you out. Um, you could be, you know, you could connected to all these different flights, right? Which that's quite an interesting ad. Um, um, and then you would be issued tourist cards by, you know, you could be issued by whatever um, shipping company or, you know, brought you over. In this case, the United Fruit Company, which has its own sort of dodgy past in Latin America, could issue a tourist card. And this tourist card would be good for two years that you could go in and out of the island. Cubans themselves were only allowed to come to the United States for about a month without having to renew. And so it really, it really gave the advantage to, to US citizens. And this, of course, is what you get, right? Which is sort of the, the ugly American, <laughs> typical ugly American down in Havana who went down to, to, to drink and have a good time. Um, this all sort of happened in, from 1952 until 1959 under the leadership of Fulgencio Batista. 
Batista had been president in the 1940s, had helped um, stage a coup. Then he had left office. He'd actually moved to the United States. And in 1952, he decided he needed to run for president again. Um, when it was obvious that he was not going to be elected, he came in and simply took over. Um, that also led to a young lawyer who was also running for Senate at the same time that his election was also canceled. So Fidel Castro, who had, was trying to get into the Senate, um, he was not allowed to, which angered him and a lot of other people. And so on July 26, 1953, Castro um, and, a, and a group of about 130 people attacked the Moncada barracks in um, Santiago de Cuba. The, the attack is a failure, but it, is, it marks the, the beginning of the revolution. And so Castro and those who survived the attack are arrested. They're sent to jail, and Castro will remain in prison until May of 1955, when Batista, for whatever reason, it was a Mother's Day gesture, decides to let these people out, um, and they leave. And and they, you know, but this is sort of the beginning of the M267, right? Of the movement of the 26th of July, which is the Cuban Revolutionary Movement. There were several others, right? But this is the one that will eventually sort of rise to the top and become the main, the main one. So after Castro gets out, he knows that he can't stay in Cuba for very long, and so he does like all good Cuban revolutionaries do, like Jose Marti, is they go to the United States, and they go there to raise money for the revolution. And so Castro did a big tour in Tampa and New York City and went around raising money for the revolution, and then afterwards he went to Mexico uh, in order to actually train, because he was a lawyer, not a, not a soldier, but he goes there to get training, and there he meets people like this Argentine doctor, Ernesto Che Guevara, and they form up a group of revolutionaries, and they plan their attack. And Castro has never been one to hide anything. He's always been quite the orator. And so, I mean, he proclaimed, he's like, you know, in, he's like, you know, in 1956, we will either be martyrs or heroes. So he tells Batista, we're coming back. Right? He, makes no, he makes no secret about it. And so in November, they board this ship, the Grama, which is just grandma, right? <laughs> and so that becomes grandma. Um, and they stick 82 people on this boat where they really probably should have had about 10. So they overload the ship and they take off from Tushpan, Mexico, and they sail to the eastern side of the island um, with, the, with the plan of going into the Sierra Maestra and joining up and getting support from the urban underground in Santiago de Cuba. This was supposed to take three days, but as you can see, it took seven. Um, they had lots of mishaps with people falling overboard and then having to like, zoom around and find them. And then eventually they, they smash into a mangrove swamp. They kind of miss land. Gavada described it as a shipwreck, not a landing. Um, and so if any of you who know about mangrove swamps, they had to wade ashore in sort of waist-deep mud um, where they had to abandon most of the heavy equipment that they had. And of course, in the meantime, Batista's flights have been looking for them because they've told them they're coming. And so, and so <laughs> Batista comes in and they strafe the beach and they strafe the beach. And so they proclaim Castro dead. They say, yeah, we got him, we got him. And they, had, they also came in and they do, they do encounter a, a force of Batista's people and they kill about 70 of the 82. And so this sort of mythical 12, which numbers actually vary, but they go with the 12, um, says they say that he's dead. So Castro realizing that you know, they're not gonna receive any more money if they don't have any support, really is looking for a way to resurrect himself and, and, and save the revolution. And so they feel the best way to do this would be to get a, a US reporter down and to put it into the US newspapers because that's where they want the money. So in February of 1957, Herbert Matthews travels to Cuba and he goes into the Sierra Maestra and he finds Fidel Castro. He's led there by Celia Sanchez and Raul Castro. They want, him to, they want to, this meeting to happen. And Celia Sanchez is really instrumental in sort of arranging this meeting. And so they have, you know, they don't really have that many followers yet. So they sort of parade the same 20 guys by them in the early morning hours <laughs> to make it feel like there's this big force. And Matthews, Matthews buys it, hook, line, and sinker. He gets a lot of blame for this later. But um, he says, you know, he, he basically puts him on the front page. And he, you know, and he sort of sends him standing there with this gun, looking very tough, alone, right? And you know, he has him sign it to prove that it's really him. And then you know, he, he just starts to describe him, right? And he describes his physicality as this strong six-footer. You know, and you see you know, how proud he is and this idea of this remarkable man of ideals and qualities of leadership. And he builds him up, right? He kind of creates this 
this persona of Fidel Castro. Um, and so afterwards, there's a media frenzy, basically, to go down and interview Fidel. They kind of ignore some of the other revolutionary leaders because Fidel's sort of exciting. This is good because the Cuban government responds by saying, oh, he never met him. They're like, because if you met him, you'd have a, a, a photo of him. And so the New York Times published that the, the following day, which is Matthews and Phil together. And so you have then sort of you know, the Chicago Sun Tribune or the Chicago Tribune. You have you know, Life and Look magazine going down. They, they bring in television reporters because that was you know, very effective. And then the, the best one for me is always this, right, which was, <laughs> So Errol Flynn, Errol Flynn actually was living, was actually living in Havana at the time with his 16-year-old or 15-year-old girlfriend, Beverly Adelad. Flynn was about 50, 51. Um, and so they couldn't stay in the States for that. And so Flynn actually goes down and makes two movies about the revolution, Cuban Rebel Girls and another one, The Cuban Story, that he thinks are going to be really big hits because everybody's so into Fidel. Little did he know, right? And so right after the revolution, the, the films were only shown like once or twice. And I think this has been almost universally proclaimed as one of the worst films ever made. <laughs> um, but so there's a, there's a frenzy. So, the revolution succeeds much more because Eisenhower, uh, Batista is so unpopular that Eisenhower eventually cuts off all aid to Batista, and there's widespread protests throughout the, throughout the island. Batista was hugely unpopular, and essentially the entire island was behind the revolution. And the revolution's main goal was to get rid of Batista. That's what they said. There was no mention of communism of any kind. They talked about social reform. They talked about, they talked about education and health. They even talked somewhat about land reform, although that was was sort of whispered. Um, and, and really, so it comes down to the United States finally saying to the Batista, you got to go, and we're not going to give you any more money, we're not going to give you any more arms. And then, you know, this sort of upsurge of popular support on the island itself. So Batista leaves famously, you know, Godfather II scene. He, he exits on uh, New Year's Eve of 1958, 1959. And then the revolution uh, officially comes to power on January 1st, 1959. And things are good between the United States and Cuba for a while. Castro comes to the United States. He's interviewed a lot. He kind of changes his persona from being that you know, hard revolutionary leader with a gun to sort of hanging out with his son, Fidelito. It's like you know, Fidelito brings him in a puppy on this, and he's speaking in English and trying to reassure sort of the US public that everything is, is going to be OK. Um, he travels to the United States in April of 1959. It's not an official visit at all. It's uh, organized by the American Association of Journalists, which made sense because they had really built him up and kind of created him. So he goes to Washington, D.C., and he states you know, the, the Gettysburg Address in English. He goes to Harvard. He goes to Princeton. He uh, does not meet with Eisenhower, but he meets with Nixon, and Nixon says that he's either the smartest or dumbest communist he's ever met. He labeled him like <laughs> from the get-go because <laughs> he didn't ask for money. It was a goodwill, a goodwill trip. Um, you know, he goes to the Bronx Zoo, and so he's he's considered a hero so much so that they're making you know comic books about him, saying you know he's the man with the beard, he's this heroic guy. They make little kids outfits with like, you know, you could go play, you know, Castro's characters in the woods and like, you know, play revolutionary leader. You know, the kids just love him. He's such a nice, fluffy guy. And so he's a hero, right? He's, he's a hero. And all of that starts to unravel <laughs> pretty fast. And essentially, what happens is that they start to do trials of people who had supported Batista, and they execute them, and they do it on television. And so it's really, it's really shocking, I think, for the United States public to see people with firing squads like being blown away, and that these feel like show trials, and so they start to get a little worried. That sort of starts it. And so this idea of like maybe this is something else, like maybe that fluffy beard is actually something to be afraid of, right? And eventually the rhetoric becomes kind of so harsh that you know Castro kind of turns to where he needs to turn to. So the Soviet Union with Khrushchev, um, they start to negotiate, and really the big the big problem comes in 1960 when Cuba buys oil from the Soviet Union. And so they buy oil, and the Eisenhower government says to the US refineries on the island, absolutely not, do not refine it. And the British also say, do not refine the oil. Whereupon Castro says, 
that's fine, and nationalizes the refineries and refines the oil. We then cut their sugar quota and then begins this kind of ping pong match back and forth of, of the one side saying we're gonna cut this and then we're gonna take this and then this and this. And then eventually, um, in January of, um, in December, January of 1960, 61, Castro says to the United States government, you have to decrease your diplomatic presence on the island from 82 people, 83 people to 11, which is what they had in Washington, D.C. And, and he says, because it's a den of spies. He's like, your embassy is a den of spies. And Eisenhower says, there's no way that we can do our job, spying, uh, by having this few people. And so in uh, January of 1961, Eisenhower breaks diplomatic relations with Cuba. And until December of 2014, we have not actually had diplomatic relations with them. So we have a long stretch of not having diplomatic relations. Um, and of course, yeah, this is what Castro becomes. So from he becomes sort of this devil. Um, and so um, as Kennedy comes in, and again, I'm going, going fast. How am I doing? Where am I at? OK, good. I'm ripping through it. Here we go. So Kennedy inherits this plan, right, co concocted by the Dulles brothers, who had successfully ousted the Arbenz government in Guatemala in 1954. So we figure, well, let's just do it again. And so, so they, they go and they decide that they're going to go into the Bay of Pigs, which, if any of you have ever visited, is just the, po quite possibly the worst place ever to swim, let alone like land an invasion force, because it's all sort of like old coral and you know mangrove swamp again, and one road leading out. And I'm like, I don't know who is thinking this, but it's a bad idea. Um, they, what they thought was that you were going to have other um, forces from the Sierra de Escambre. Oh, do I have a point? I have a pointer. The Escambre up here that was going to join into the force. But at the end, it didn't really happen. And so they attack um, the 2506 Brigade is the brigade of the, of the Bay of Pigs. That's be the last four digits of the social security number of a guy who died during training. And so they dedicate the brigade to him. And what happens is that they capture um, about 1,200 people, and then they ransom them. They're going to hold them for ransom until December of 1962. And then we eventually give about $80 million of medicine and tractor parts uh, in order for them to come back. In the meantime, this escalates the Kennedy's resolve to get rid of this guy. Um, and so you, this is when you get sort of Operation Mongoose and Northwoods and all the crazy ideas of an exploding cigar or you know, an exploding conch shell because he liked to scuba dive or you know, dousing with LSD when he's on television so that he looks crazy. So there was all sorts of, there's all sorts of plans. And there's great books basically detailing all the plans. But then we're sort of pushed into a situation in October of 1962, which is the missile crisis. So Cuba, sensing that the United States was going to invade, I mean, we were, we were holding operations in the Caribbean, naval operations called ORSAC, which is Castro spelled backwards. And we were invading with thousands of people onto the beach. And so they thought, oh, it's coming. So they appeal to the Soviets, and the Soviets are more than happy to place missiles on the island. And so they do, and then this leads to sort of probably the, the most tense part of the Cold War because they realize that, you know, from, from the, these bases on Cuba, that these missiles, these immediate, immediate and intermediate range missiles, could hit pretty much everywhere in the United States. We survive. <laughs> Just. But it's, you know, but we survive. Um, and so. And so and so eventually the missiles are pulled out. And what this guarantees is that Kennedy says, we will not invade the island, which makes him hugely unpopular amongst the, amongst the Miami Cubans, who are now starting to come over in, in bigger and bigger numbers. And, but that is when we really say, we won't, we won't uh, go. This is also when Kennedy signs the Trading with the Enemy Act, which prohibits travel. He apparently goes out and gets his assistant to go get him something like 1,200 cigars uh, beforehand so that he can have his <laughs> own personal supply. Um, but you know, he, he makes sure that that, but then it's like, that's it. And so we cut off. And tourism, which had been at about 300,000 arrivals in 1957, plummets to 3,000. And international tourism is virtually dead on the island, really, until the 1970s. They have national tourism, and people go to the hotels who are Cubans. But in terms of international arrivals, that's not going to start picking up again until the Canadians discover it, basically, in the 1970s. You have Eastern Bloc people going, but it becomes very, it becomes very limited. So here's, uh, 
Here is Khrushchev defanging him, right? He was very upset. He was upset because he wanted Guantanamo back, right? The United States got Guantanamo after the Spanish-American War. He was demanding it back. And then Kennedy makes other efforts, right? This sort of alliance for progress, Peace Corps, which I was a part of, was part of this. It was, you know, we wanted to stop the spread of, of communism throughout, uh, throughout Latin America. We published you know, millions of comic books that we distribute. We distribute tons of films. We do everything we can, including, you know, in course, like supporting uh, very harsh right-wing dictatorships to stop any other Cuba from happening in the, in the hemisphere. Um, on the island itself, people become disenchanted with what they see, you know, which was a revolution. And although it benefits a vast majority in terms of the social reforms, those people who were of the upper and middle classes, who were intellectuals, artists, people who couldn't do their work anymore, they had a choice, which was either you could stay on the island and risk arrest, or worse, or you could leave. And so this starts a massive flood of, of exiles. And the main brunt of them come on what becomes known as the Freedom Flights, which exists from 1965 to 1973. These were two flights daily that came from the island to Miami. It was very well organized. Your name had to be on two lists, one in Cuba and one in the US. This is how the vast majority of people come, not via raft. They come via jet airline. Um, and so this kind of starts it. And these people who come first, they are the golden exiles, right? They, they integrate very well. They're educated. They have money. They're white. They have, and so people view them as being like, these are the perfect immigrants that, that come in. Um, right, and they are. In terms of the US view towards the island, this kind of sums it up, which is that it just sort of vanishes. San Juan miraculously moves to the, to the west, and that, you know, touring in the Caribbean becomes, you know, Cuba absent, um, very much so. Um, this changes a little bit in the 1970s. Jimmy Carter uh, attempts to normalize relations with the Cubans. Um, they open the interest sections in 1977. So we move right back into the, into the same building, but it's technically the Swiss embassy. The Cubans move back into their building, but it's the Czechoslovakian embassy. And so we, we sort of start trying to have this, uh, this relationship. Um, you know, and, and trying to normalize it. Unfortunately, a couple things, mainly the Cuban invasion into Angola, um, and then also uh, more tension on the island leads to heightened tension by the end. This was the classic uh, billboard, right, that said, you know, uh, Mr. Imperialist, we have absolutely no fear, and it faced, it faced the interest section, right? And so the interest section remained open, but it became, which I'll show you in a minute, it became this place of protest, basically, where the island communicates with the interest section, which is kind of interesting. So this leads to another wave of migration, right? In 1980, poor Carter. He has a very bad time at the end in terms of his foreign relations. So right, we have the Mariel boat lift that goes from April to October. The brunt of the people, uh, about 100,000, arrive in May of 1980. Uh, Carter basically accepts them because they're, they are Cold War political escapees, just the same as if you've gone over the Berlin Wall, you're escaping you know, across the Florida Straits. It was very detrimental to, to the Soviets in terms of propaganda and the Cubans themselves. And so we bring them all in. The Cubans themselves, like, like send them out with massive protests, you know, call them, you know, before they were gusanos, they were worms, anti-revolutionaries. Now they're escoria, they're scum. And they're like, get out, we don't need you, we don't want you. And Castro being the 3D chess player that he is when it comes to foreign relations is very wise. And he doesn't just send out family members, he dumps his jails, he dumps his insane asylums, he picks up anybody who he feels to be unrevolutionary, he sticks them all on these boats, and he sends them to the United States. And the US doesn't know what to do, so they build camps under freeways in Miami. They put them in different camps all around the country. And you know, out of the 125,000, about a fifth had criminal records in Cuba. But that being said, you could be picked up, of course, in Cuba for loitering, right, and have a criminal record. So out of the 125, there was probably about 3,000 who were possibly serious criminals. And unfortunately for the Cuban exile community, that was enough. It was enough to kind of change the image. And you kind of have a perfect storm of sort of the rise of cocaine in the US in the 1980s, and Colombians who need distribution, and these people, very you know, unemployed males who are able to do it. So this is where you get kind of Miami Vice and Scarface, and this change in sort of the way that the exile community is looked at. And there's definitely a sense in Miami of pre-Marialitos and post-Marialitos. 
Um, so Cuba kind of, you know, in the 80s is doing okay. Lots of aid, right, from the Soviet Union in the form of oil. So they would trade sugar for oil. They were getting huge amounts of aid. And then when the Soviet Union collapses, right, in 1989, 90, that stops that aid. And so what you have is in Cuba is the beginning of what becomes known as the special period, which begins in 1991 and is questioned as to when or if it has actually ended. So there's, there's a lot of debate about that. Personally, I would say early 2000s, it starts to get a lot better. But what happens is, as you can see, Cuban wages precipitously fall off. And this has real implications on the ground for the Cubans. The United States, for, it part, for its part, under Clinton, tightens, tightens up the embargo, right? Helms-Burton comes in. We actually try to unseat them. We're like, you know, they're weak. We're going to go after them. Uh, Cuba becomes basically a post-petroleum economy. So they start running buses. People are on bikes. People are on horseback. There's no petrochemicals at all. Um, they suffer. They go from, you know, from you know, 2,500, 3,000, 3,500 a day calorie diet down to 1,800, 1,500. The young and the very old, of course, are affected the most by this. People lose tons of weight. They're on foot, they're on bikes. And so one good upshot from this is, of course, the rates of heart disease and type 2 diabetes <laughs> drop in a huge way. But you are sort of facing um, famine conditions. So back to rudimentary farming, farming by hand. They become the best in the world, not because they wanted to, but because they had to at organic agriculture. And they're still very good at it, growing these sort of orgoponicles amongst the city, so doing urban ag, eliminating the need to transport the ag, growing it right there. Um, allowing, this is when sort of small businesses and allowing small businesses and selling things to start to happen. But it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult time. This is when then they're going to bring in, essentially, I got more market pictures. Um, it's going to cause widespread anger, right? And so people are hungry. They're, they're angry. And so in 1994, it really erupts as a massive riot. A couple hundred thousand people take to the streets in Havana. And in response to this, Castro says, fine, we're going to open up the borders, and anybody who wants to leave of their own power can. And so about 40,000 people in August and September of 1994 are picked up by the US Coast Guard. These are, this is really the first time that you have massive rafting going on with people building their own rafts. 40,000 people are rescued. At least double of that die. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of heartache with that. And this one I love this is a classic picture of this guy. He's on a raft. He's cut away from his group. The other eight or nine people that were with him never make it. And then he's taken to Guantanamo, and he becomes the poster child, right? Of, and this is him holding the poster of himself, which is awesome. And eventually, the 40,000 people are allowed um, into the United States. The, this is when the Cubans basically really push for massive tourism. Varadero and the sort of beach tourism, again, is sort of this big thing that they have to offer. They do lots of joint ventures with European and Jamaican and you know, different companies. And then the, the advertisement is right back to what it was in the 50s, which is you know, come to Cuba, meet this beautiful woman, right? easy flights, right? singles week at, at Breeze's Habacoa. Right? And so this is, and this is at the same time you get people renting rooms in their houses. Um, so sort of the Casa Particular comes, Palerares, private restaurants come into being. So you have this sort of flourishing of, of tourism development. Um, you also have the rise of what becomes known as jineterismo. Jinitera is, uh, means jockey. Jinitera is a jockey. And so both male and women as jinitero, jiniteras, which is hustlers. So hustling on the, on the street, trying to get money, or many times jiniteras were prostitutes. And so sort of you have this sort of rise uh, of this other parts of the informal economy. And what really kind of saves Cuba is not tourism, but Hugo Chavez. So in 1999, they broker a deal where Castro receives oil for technical support, and that's what's going to really start to pull them out of this problem. Tourism continues to develop. So really quickly, and then I'll stop, which is that some other kind of flashpoints was, I don't know, how many of you remember Elian Gonzalez, right? So Elian, right, who was a rafter, whose mother perishes. 
he then is uh, you know, you know, brought into the Cuban exile community and his cousin basically, they parade him around you know, in front of the media and they basically say he has, to, you know, he has to stay. The Cubans say no, his father is still alive and we have to bring him back. So that's the intersection, now the embassy again and they're protesting in front of that. Uh, you know, they sort of change it around and put statues. And there was these massive Cuban protests in Miami. There's these massive protests. And this poor little boy starts to take on this kind of religious significance. They thought that this was the Virgin Mary appearing in a bank window. And, you know, there's all this stuff. But eventually, eventually he's returned, you know, via force because Janet Reno uh, sends in the ATF and they take him out. And he's returned to his father. Uh, the Miami Cubans were very upset. They made a museum out of his uncle's apartment. So this is all of his stuff. Uh, but this is Elyon, you know, pretty present day. Uh, and then the other sort of last part, and then we'll get to the, to the main thing. Well, the Cuban Five, this also happens, which is these guys were arrested for espionage in the United States. Uh, they were spying on Cuban exile groups who were against Castro. They're arrested by the FBI and put in prison, which becomes a big part of the negotiation that just happened was to get these guys back. Um, and then this is one last thing and then we'll go to present, which is in 2004, uh, this is the intersection again, is sort of this interesting place where they kind of communicate back and forth. At Christmas of 2004, they decided to put up this number 75 on the side of the building. This was the number of Cubans imprisoned that year for political reasons. So the Cubans, of course, didn't think that this was an appropriate Christmas display and said, you know, you got to take it down. And when the Bush uh, administration refused, when the, when the intersection leader refused, then the Cubans put these up, right? And so they're like, okay. You want to play this game, we'll stick this up. And so they started putting these billboards up, and this becomes known as the billboard war. So not to be outdone, we smuggle in these big letters, and we start broadcasting messages on the top of the intersection that said things like, you know, was, you know the, the Cuban is waiting for a, a transitional government, and quotes from Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi, and, and even things just like, Happy New Year, but... We, they, it couldn't do the accent, so instead of saying Feliz Año Nuevo, it said Feliz Ano Nuevo, which means something very different. You know, so, was, um, so the Cubans got mad about this, and they said, okay, fine, we're gonna put up these flags and obscure, obscure the view, right? And so each flag representing um, a martyr to the revolution. Um, and so this back and forth until Obama comes in and they take the scrolling marquee down and they change the flags to Cuban national flags. So up to the present, um, Pope Francis, the popes have been going there now since Pope John Paul, Pope Benedict went, and then Francis, and they, they kind of have been part of the scene, the Catholic Church working behind the scenes. So they start brokering the deal basically in 2013 in Canada, hosting talks, very high level talks, and then eventually, on December 17th, what has been become known now in Cuba as D-17 is when uh, Obama and Raul Castro at the same moment announced that they are going to restart diplomatic, formal diplomatic relations. Um, and so we are now working back towards uh, joining this. And so I just took these pictures a couple weeks ago. So this is, the Cube, this is billboards to the Cuban Five saying welcome back, right, that we're with you, we're behind you, we're victorious, right, that they're viewing this as a victory, that they've come back. Um, you know, in terms of people who want us to get rid of the embargo, who want to normalize, it's, it's pretty much, it's, it's definitely a majority, people who want it gone. Um, of course, Miami Cubans still would have, have problems with this, and it will be a political issue in the upcoming election as to where the candidates stand on this. Um, but here is just the other day, here's the Cuban now embassy, right? So no longer an intersection, that's the US flag, which has not flown there since, uh, since 1961. Um, so that was pretty exciting to see. Um, and there's the telling you what you can get done, which is also pretty exciting. So this is all new. And then instead of black flags, right, we now have Cuban national flags kind of, and the US flag behind it, sort of symbolizing this back. So that's, this is what I've just done for you, basically. Right? Sort of taking you through all these years. And what it really means, this kind of is at the end, right, is that we're reopening these embassies. We've done that. Easing travel restrictions, which we are doing that too, which is why you can go. Credit cards have not happened yet, right? And then um, allowing to bring back Cuban goods, you can do that. So the big changes will be direct flights, getting rid of like travel restrictions for everybody so you don't even have to go on a tour, and then being able to use plastic instead of having to carry cash, which will, which will make it really good. So that's it. Thank you.
if, if there are any questions, I am going to bring this mic around because we want to make sure that we capture your voices for posterity. Very nice recapping of everything. It really was <laughs> Thank succinct you. and nice. I'm curious about the United Fruit Company. What, when was that taken over? I know my parents had friends from the Yakima Valley. He was killed, a, a shot down there, and I wonder when that happened. So yeah, so the fruit company was taken over in '60. Um, so right as right as kind of the right as kind of that tit for tat with oil starts to happen, that's one of the biggest companies that they take over right away. They nationalize that right away, and it was it was very symbolic because of the role that. Uh, UFCO had played in Guatemala in 54 and that. And so they recognized that as symbolic and that it was such a powerhouse in Latin America. So there's, there's footage, there's, there's footage of, of when Castro is doing it. And when he announces that we're nationalizing, he just gets this kind of like, oh yeah, like we, we just did that, right? He's very, he's very proud of that moment. I wonder if you can speak to the uh, 2,000 or more Cubans who are escaping through Latin America, uh, through Central America. So that's that's happening right now. So that there there still is waves of migration leaving, um, and in terms of how they're getting out now, it's that is an interesting phenomenon. Is that instead of trying to come directly to the U.S., they're coming into Central America, Mexico, even South America, and then joining kind of the normal migrant trails basically into the United States, and then crossing illegally as others are. I, I think the reason for that is because our policy now is that, since the end of the Cold War, is that anyone that we interdict at sea, we take back. And so this wet foot, dry foot policy is still in effect, and so if you make it, then you can process through and you can probably stay. And they still get, Cubans still get some preferential treatment, but that's gonna end, right? And so I think they're seeing this as, a, as an easier way, although I can't imagine being in Central America and then crossing through Mexico to be easier, but perhaps just because of technology and the ability to intercept at sea, they're, they're seeing that. And less, in some ways less dangerous, although still very dangerous. Uh, what do you see as uh, maybe the next steps in normalization of relationships? I, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal that says there's an incredible brain drain of doctors because of favorable United States uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, support for them coming over. Uh, that obviously has repercussions for the country. Sure. So I mean, there's several things. There's several things kind of all over the place that would happen to make it kind of normal, normal, right? And so, one of them is, I mean, on our end, what has to happen is the ending of the embargo, which cannot happen unless Congress allows that to happen. I would also be shocked if we get an actual ambassador into the embassy before the election. That would also be interesting to see. Could happen, lots of things are happening that I would say, oh, that's never gonna happen, and then, you know, happens next week. So that, you know, this, this sort of progression towards normalization and uh, many people in Congress, right, have said that there's no way that they're going to eliminate the, the embargo. So as long as that stays in effect, we're not going to be normal. Um, as far as the brain drain that you're talking about, that's really on the part of the Cubans to fix the economy. Because since the special period, the economy split into two currencies. At first, as of 1993, they allowed US dollars to be the tourist currency. They changed that in the early 2000s, 2004, and they switched to what is now known as the KUK, the convertible Cuban peso. The KUK economy is sort of the tourist economy. One KUK is worth 30 Cuban pesos, but a brain surgeon only earns about 900 Cuban pesos a month. So we're talking about $30, whereas a cab driver can earn that in one ride. And so you have an economy that's completely inverted as to how it should be. Um, and so whoever can come up with how to fix that is probably gonna win, I always say is gonna win the Nobel Prize for economics because it's very, it's gonna be very difficult to, to rectify that. But that's something that will help also make it normal. For those of us who will be going soon, are we gonna be restricted from what we can see and to wander around or can we go everywhere? You can go everywhere. Uh, I would say don't, don't run up and take pictures of police 
but I wouldn't do that in Portland either. Uh, and uh, I would say, you know, you don't, you know, uh, army or anything that looks kind of sensitive, but more than likely you're not going to be near anything like that, right? But, but in terms of in Havana or I don't know where all you're all going, you, you won't, you can stop and take pictures of anything. I drove the whole length of the island in 2013 and nobody ever stopped me ever. So, and I was driving badly and taking pictures out the window. And so, yeah, you can take, you can, you can, you'll be fine. Can, can you speak uh, of uh, what happens when Raul Castro, I think it's in 2017, steps back? Yeah, so, and of course I knew this, I should have wrote it down because I never can remember his name. Uh, they have the vice president, whose name always escapes me. Um, he is next in line, and he's a 55-year-old technocrat, and essentially he is hardline. Um, that's from what we've been told. We know very little about him, which is why I can't remember his name. It starts with an M. M. Anyway, he, um, yeah, he, he, they, so they already have a successor. It will be interesting to see two things. One, whether or not Raul truly steps down. Um, I mean, because these Castro boys go on forever. Remember, there's an older brother, Ramon, that, that is still alive, right? Who's <laughs> never really been involved. And then Fidel's still around. They thought he'd be dead by now. Raul's still around. So my assumption is he will step down and that they will change power. And then we'll see if he is as pragmatic as Raul has been, then the changes will continue. I think they want to try, with good reason, to protect certain tenets of the revolution, namely education, health, housing. Land reform has kind of changed, and that's going back to private ownership. But you know, we'll see what happens. A question: um, Because of their previous relationship with Russia, is it? What do you see as the future with Putin and that uh, potential uh, combination? Yeah, I, I honestly think that that they are looking more towards. If they're going to look towards anybody like that, they're going to look towards China. That, that in Ch the Chinese are very much there. They're the ones actually helping them develop what little petroleum that they have. Um, the relationship with them is much closer. The, I, don't, I don't really see any kind of renewed interest on the part of the Cubans to get back with Russia. I mean, Russia's kind of isolating itself and kind of becoming more of a you know, pariah state. And so, and there's this, they never really had that much similar between them. I mean, that was the interesting thing, was that there was such a disconnect between the Soviets and the Cubans themselves that that was always a, a bit of a tense relationship. So in my guess, and again, could be very wrong, I don't really see that going anywhere. The Chinese, absolutely. Everybody else, of course, trades with them. So they have relationships with all of Latin America and all other European countries. Um, they'll foster in Asia, they'll foster those more. They are uh, in agriculture. You mean? Yes. They are not feeding themselves yet, so they are still reliant upon uh, money to bring in agricultural foodstuffs. Um, and so, the more I think that they privatize ag and make agricultural pay, then the more food that they'll get. And as far as organics go. Hopefully, they're going to keep doing that as much as they can within the cities. But the assumption would be, just like anywhere else, that to do massive monocropping, you know, factory farming, you, you're going to use petrochemicals again. I'm following Tim's they, lead. <laughs> um, I believe that they've been doing research and actually have brought out some sort of medical treatment for lung cancer that is supposed to be kind of revolutionary. Um, but that's about all I know about it. Do you know much? And could you tell us a little bit about it? All I can, I can say only very broadly that the Cubans have been some of the best in terms of bio sort of research and medical research for a very long time. And sort of historically, the thing that you can point to is that when HIV hits in the 1980s and you have a lot of people, soldiers who are in Angola and they come back infected, they take very draconian measures, right? And the exiles point at that and say, this is a horrible thing, that they essentially quarantine these people. But within the quarantine, they also 
are able to give them the best food and give them the best medicines, and they work very closely with the French, and they are able to quickly develop these kind of drug cocktails and, you know, and sort of not to cure it yet, but to make it so that you can live a full life. And then they stopped the, they stopped the mandatory quarantining in 93. And so it was, it was uh, you know, it was a harsh, it was a harsh effort, I guess, but with a disease that was unknown and that they've done very well. I myself have been to the doctor there a couple times because I get sick, because uh, I drink water and do stupid things. And, um, and so uh, I've gotten food poisoning. And I've been, I've been always incredibly impressed right, with, the, with the quality of care and the facilities and the general attitude and the fact that you say, OK, what do I owe you? And they're like, nothing. And so it's, that's a pretty amazing, it's an amazing thing. Has the Venezuelan connection pretty well broken at this point with Chavez gone in the recent elections? So, so certainly, certainly, uh, oops. so certainly Hugo and Fidel were tight. I mean, it was really like a father-son relationship. I mean, there's there's lots of video of them together with with Hugo. Hugo loved to sing, and so he would like be singing songs, and like Fidel would just be kind of like nodding at him, like I'm going with this. I'm just gonna go. And, um, and so they were really, really close. And so, I mean, again, surprising that, that Chavez dies first. And Chavez's successor has maintained the relationship. They still have this oil for, for technocrat relationship. But what I see is that strain on the Venezuelan side is going to probably cause them to, in some ways, have to pull back. But it'll be interesting to see if the United States will then pick up that slack, right, in terms of the trade. Besides the healthcare there is wonderful. I also hear that the education system is very good in Cuba. Yeah. So and has been for quite some time. Yeah, so cradle to grave. I mean, you know, you, you basically can start, uh, your kids can go into daycare starting at one and it's state controlled. It'd be like going to kindergarten here. And then, you know, all the way through becoming an MD or whatever you want. The caveat, of course, is that if you become an MD or you become a lawyer or professor or whatever it is, then the state owns your brain. And so you can't, you can't go into private practice. You can't become a lawyer and you know, offer any kind of work for pay. You can't be a private doctor and get paid. So the only way that those people have been able to make money is they also, like I've stayed with a lot of doctors because they have rooms usually in their houses that they rent out. And so they are in everybody's everybody's doing multiple things. Everybody's in the tourist economy, everybody's in the state economy, people are still getting their rations from state stores and yet buying stuff with the kook. So everybody's, you know, they are all hustlers and they're all having to figure out how to make their way. But yes, I mean, you can get great ed, but then it's always a question of what do you, what do, you do? Yeah, which is why people will leave. <laughs> um, does medical tourism seem like a viable option then because so many people are involved in multiple industries? So I saw actually a billboard in the Havana airport, which I took pictures of, which I should have, again, there was too many slides as it was, but um, you know, I saw this billboard that basically said Salud por Todos, and it was, it was an advertising of a company that was specifically there to say, if you've got an ailment, come on down. And of course, that will be how they will make money, right? Is that it will be like India or other places where you can go and you can get care that will cost you a lot less than if you were to do the same procedure, right, in the United States. So that's what that looked like to me. So that was the first time I've ever seen it advertised, but I think it's coming. There was an interesting piece on the news, I can't remember if it was last night or today, about tourism in Cuba. They were saying that uh, hotels are booked, uh, private restaurants uh, have a waiting list and they work seven days a week, that the booking for a hotel was like $300 a night. So if you're working for 30 bucks a, a month, how does that relate to $300 a night? So, and again, because there's these two economies, right? So if you are, if you are working in a state-owned hotel, right, you are also only making that very low salary unless you're getting tipped on the side by a tourist who might just be tipping you, right? And then, but 
if you're renting a room out in your own house, then you pay taxes to the state, and then you also fudge the books. And so you, you make sure that you're making more than you actually record. And you, know, you do have like you know, each room, back in the day, a few years back, it was $25 per room per day, no matter, you know, how, no matter if um, they were full or not. And so you kind of were getting taxed on that rate, right, that they were taxing on that. So, but as far as the amounts of tourists just being there, and this is high season right now, things were booked. I mean, there were, the, the Capri was full of people, the Nacional was full of people, the Riviera is in ill repair, so the one side was totally dark, which I'm like, they've got to fix that. Um, but yeah, we tried to go to restaurants that, you know, we were told by people, oh, you got to go to this restaurant, it's the best Paladar in the city, right? We'd go there, they'd be like, do you have reservations? And I'd be like, no, I didn't even know that was possible to do. And they'd be like, yeah. They're like, no way. And so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people, and I think it's, the more that the United States gets involved, the more, the more it'll be there. I mean, right now they get about two and a half million arrivals a year, right? The majority of those people come from Canada or Europe, right? But the numbers that I've always seen is that the, the smallest number that the second that it opens, really opens to the United States will be to double that, right? And I mean, that will be, that will be something for the Cubans to experience. I mean, I think they'll be like, oh my God, what's going on? So we are out of time uh, for today. Thanks for your questions. Give uh, Blair Woodard a huge hand. That was the best hour in history of Cuba ever. Um, and uh, next week, Mel Gertoff will be here speaking about the Koreas. And there is so much going on around that that who knows what will have blown up by uh, Friday this time next week. Thanks.